Well, it is a warm one out here today, but uh, we're going to be going over what happened uh, with the best day in racing today. There is so much to talk about. So let's get to it. And uh, by the way, this is no longer called final analysis. Time for a name change. This is the fuel. <laughs> What is happening ladies and germs, this is the Packer Man, and welcome to today's edition of The Fuel, and the first episode of it being called The Fuel, originally Final Analysis, but I decided to turn it back to what I originally wanted to call it, so here we go. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the Memorial Day weekend double header, the greatest day in racing basically. Today we're going to be reviewing the 103rd Indianapolis 500, which just ended a little while ago. And the Coca-Cola 600, which at the time I'm recording this, starts in about two hours. So, uh, in between the Indy, Indy 500 review and the Coke 600 review, um, there's going to be a bit of a fast, a space-time fast forward. So... That's going to be interesting, but, um, man, there is so much to talk about from the past two weeks. Last, I had the last two weeks off. Um, basically didn't upload any videos of any kind on my channel. Just felt like I needed a break after the whole pro Jared debacle and being a fan of him for as long as I did for over a decade. And after all the crap that came out about him, it's just like, well, that was depressing. So I felt like I needed a break from uploading just in general. But uh, here we are back again two weeks later. And where do we even start this week? I mean, there is so much to talk about this week. This is probably going to be the longest video um, that I made so far for the fuel. But uh, we're going to try to get through it all kind of quickly. Because i got a lot of stuff to do. Today. So uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, some of the uh, news stories that have kind of taken basically their own life form in the last two weeks. All Star Night. It didn't suck for once. And I'm talking about All Star Night as a whole. Usually the All Star Open is pretty good, but All Star Night as a whole is actually pretty interesting. Uh, the All Star Open, of course, has per the usual it seems, um, has great racing, had a couple of so it's going to be another one of them type of videos where I get constantly interrupted. God damn it. Well, anyways, as I was saying, um, the All-Star Open is usually pretty good and we saw a couple of great finishes in the first two stages. And uh, eventual All-Star Race winner Kyle Larson, I think, also had to qualify into the All-Star Race from the Open, which he did in, by winning Stage 3. Uh, and then the All-Star Race itself was actually pretty interesting for once. So... Um, including, and with uh, Kyle Larson winning the race, I mean, let's be honest here, he needed that victory in the worst possible way. And, um, considering all the crap that he's gone through really the last year and a half, um, basically being winless, um, he definitely needed this All-Star win the most, I think, this year. Um, so yeah, the All-Star race was actually pretty interesting for once. Um, especially considering what happened afterwards. Uh, Clint Boyer decided to go full spurred nuclear on Ryan Newman because uh, he felt that Newman spun him during the cool down lap in turns one and two when the fact of the matter was Boyer actually came down on Newman. So I'm not exactly sure why um, Boyer decided to, you know, go 
full moron mode, but you know, it was, it was pretty entertaining to say the least. It was like one of them rock on sockum robots. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. But yeah, that was uh, another one of the reasons why the All Star, why the All Star race was um, pretty entertaining to say the least. More entertaining than a lot of the last few All Star races, to be quite honest. Daytona or Indianapolis 500 Bump Day. There were some in the media that, su that were suggesting that they should get rid of it, yet it delivered um, well, one of the most entertaining qualifying sessions in recent memory when you had Fernando Alonso um, basically on his last legs trying to basically qualify for the Indianapolis 500 to have a shot at completing the Triple Crown. And it looked like he was going to be in, but Kyle Kaiser had a very spirited effort uh, during his run and was the last car to get in, and Fernando Alonso was the first car out. So Alonso shot um, at completing the Triple Crown. Uh, we'll have to wait one more year, unfortunately. Of course, there were some concerns about um, the Indianapolis 500 in practice, but we had a couple of pretty big crashes where uh, the cars were getting sideways and uh, catching some air. Um, I know James Hinchcliffe uh, went over, Kyle Kaiser um, nearly went over as well, um, Brandon Alonso had a crash. So there was some legitimate concerns. Uh, about crashes in the Indianapolis 500. We really only had one major crash, and that was late in the race, so unfortunately, no, no, none of the drivers were hurt, although uh, there were probably a few crew members that were hurt. We're going to get to that in a bit in uh, pit road shenanigans. But uh, like I said, we're going to be getting to that here in a moment. A little bit of NASCAR news. Um, NASCAR has confirmed that they have bought out International Speedway Corporation uh, for $2 billion. So that was a pretty uh, significant uh, acquisition for NASCAR. So basically, I think they now have ownership. NASCAR itself has ownership of all of the uh, racetracks that were under the ISC umbrella. And what a lot of fans are hoping for is that maybe this will be even more of an indication that uh, this, the, when 2021 rolls around, um, the schedule will receive quite the big shakeup. We don't know if that's actually going to be the case, but um, we'll have to wait and see what happens here. Getting back to IndyCar racing, uh, the Freedom 100 once again uh, delivers um, on yet another photo finish. Uh, I can't remember the driver's names right off the top of my head because I'm not familiar with the drivers in Indy, Car Indy, uh, Indy Light Series, but um, yeah, I think this is like the fourth year in a row where we've had a photo finish uh, in this race. And the uh, margin of victory was seven one thousandths of a second, which, believe it or not, is only the fourth best finish, the fourth closest finish in. Indianapolis history. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> of course, I don't think it's going to be awfully difficult to duplicate the absolute awesomeness that was the 2016 finish of the Freedom 100, where we went four wide at the finish. But it just seems like the Freedom 100 delivers every single year. And, um,. It's always a great prelude to the Indianapolis 500. One more bit of news is that IndyCar uh, unveiled a new um, Halo-style protection protect, uh, protection unit for um, the IndyCars that apparently is going to be uh, um, debuted 
beginning next season, and that's the uh, windscreen, which uh, it basically looks like a like a windshield that basically covers. Um, it's a see-through windscreen uh, that basically protects the drivers from flying debris, um, which you know I'm fine with. I really don't give a crap what it looks like as long as it protects the drivers because. You know, there have been far too many instances where we've had errant debris, you know, strike drivers in the head and either caused serious injuries or, in a couple of occasions, um, death. Of course, the most recent example was Justin Wilson at Pocono. So hopefully, uh, this new windscreen will prevent that from ever happening again. We can only hope, though. Alright, so... Those are the news stories from this week. Got home actually rather quickly. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and get into um, the first review of the day. Uh, the 103rd Indianapolis 500. So, Simon Pagano uh, took the P1 Polo Award, and that's where he starts. And he was pretty much a factor for the entirety of this race. Had over a hundred laps. The last time that happened was back in 2010. Um, this wasn't a case where he led up a lot of the early portion of the race and then faded at the end. No, he was a factor all day long. Uh, we had a good clean start. Uh, Rossi and Power had great starts. Uh, we had three wide racing down the back stretch. Uh, Power and Newgarden go side by side for third for almost an entire lap, which was crazy. Uh, Spencer Piggott got into uh, that battle as well. So things were getting really dicey uh, in the early portion of this race. Uh, the first caution would come out on lap six when Colton Herta comes to a stop in turn four uh, with a gearbox issue. Apparently, at the beginning of the race, he wasn't able to shift up into sixth gear. And um, that eventually caused uh, the gearbox to uh, fail. Sorry about that. Damn it. Goddamn wind. Eh, sorry about that. Anyways, as I was saying. Um, so I eventually caused the gearbox to fail four laps into the race. You know, basically, you're there for an entire month to get prepared for you know, the Indianapolis 500, and then you only get to run four laps in the race itself. That's got to suck, majorly. And honestly, since Colton Herta won the race at Circuit of the Americas, he's had four straight DNFs. Uh, all of them, pretty much, I mean, two of them, you can't really say it's his fault. It's mechanical issues. So, I mean, the last four races have been really tough for Herta. Um, his stock has really taken a tumble. Although it wasn't really all his fault. Um, so Pagano leads on the restart. Uh, Power goes around the outside of Carpenter for second. So Penske starts playing keep away um, with Ed Carpenter racing. Um, so Carpenter was third and Spencer Pickett <clears throat> is running fourth at the moment. So things start to stretch out a little bit. Things kind of settle down uh, in the other portion of the race here. Um, Pagano kicks off green flag, stops on lap 33, and the concern for his team early on was that he was leading maybe a little bit too much in the early going, in the early going, and the concern there is he was maybe burning a little bit too much fuel leading as opposed to following where he could draft, and, um, you could save a lot of fuel that way, but, um, Pagano somehow made it work, and a lot of the cautions really fell his way, too, which also helped his cause. Um, Davison gets knocked backwards on the pit lane after being hit by Castro Neves, um, which resulted in Castro Neves getting a drive through penalty for avoidable contact. However, in my opinion, it was a bad call. It was a dumb penalty on IndyCar's part because Davison basically missed his pit. I mean, he was not going to be able to make it into his pit lane. He had already basically gone by it. And he basically almost came to a stop right in front of Castro Neves. 
uh, who had nowhere to go, basically. I mean, what is Castroneves going to do? I mean, he was about as far over towards the wall as he could have been without actually hitting the wall. So, I mean, how is that Castroneves' fault? I mean, once again, and this is not the first time this year this has happened, IndyCar with a blown call. Of course, the most egregious one was the Long Beach car. <sighs> Sorry about that, I got interrupted yet again. <sighs> but yeah, bottom line is the, the call was dumb. And it's not the first time it's happened this year. So any car once again drops the ball on that one. So Pagano cycles back to the lead. He now leads by 2.7 seconds, uh, but power starts closing back in on him. Uh, ben Hanley slow on the track, and it turned out he had a drivetrain issue. Uh, so I think that put him out of the race. Uh, Pagano kicks off the second round of pit stops on lap 65. So that pretty much tells you that there wasn't really a whole lot going on in the early portion of this race. Although, I mean, it's a 500 mile race, so. I mean, they are going to take it e a little bit easy in the first portion and then really ramp it up, which is what happened. Um, so Carpenter gets by Power for second uh, before the pit stops. And Power slides through his pit, and he would also get a penalty for hitting one of his crew members, although that wouldn't be enforced uh, until the next caution, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, coming on to the pit lane, Rossi nearly loses it on the pit lane. And then um, Jordan King uh, coming into his pit lane hits one of the tires and one of the tires basically shoots right into the um, right front tire changer who was there ready to change the tires. And um, those tires aren't, they aren't light. I mean, they're easily 35 to 50 pounds, somewhere right around in there. And it basically got launched right at this uh, crew member and... Um, he basically couldn't walk off on his own power, so he might have actually had a broken leg. Um, hopefully that's not the case. Um, and the second caution comes out in lap 74, uh, when Kyle Kaiser gets up into the marbles in turn three, spins it out, uh, tries to save it, but pounds the wall in turn four, and that's the end of his run. Of course, Kyle Kaiser was the one who knocked Fernando Alonso uh, out of the Indianapolis 500 on bump day. So. Uh, Pagano leads on the restart and gets a great restart. Uh, drivers start slicing and dicing uh, back in the pack. Uh, and then Pagano kicks off the next round of green flag pit stops on lap 101. Scott Dixon being the fuel saver that he is, he's probably the best at that. Stayed out the longest and finally pits from the lead on lap 112. So he was basically getting the best fuel mileage out of anybody. Uh, Rossi um, had a little bit of trouble on this pit stop, but managed to get by Newgarden and Carpenter for second. So Rossi had a pretty, a pretty good race car at this point. Uh, Pagano cycles back with the lead. Rossi keeps things close with Pagano. Uh, Pagano once again kicks off green flag pit stops on lap 130. And then in the middle of these green flag pit stops, there's a couple of uh, big moments that happen here. First off, uh, Alexander Rossi on his pit stop had a lot of problems with uh, the fueler. Uh, for some reason, uh, the fueler was not um, sending gas into uh, the race car. So they basically spent almost a half a minute there and Rossi was incredibly frustrated and thinking that, you know, they lost the race right there. But the third caution of the race came out on lap 138 when Marcus Erickson spins on pit road. He was basically trying to come onto pit road pretty quickly, but locked it up and spun on pit road, which necessitated the caution coming out, uh, which basically saved Rossi's race right there because he actually, um, because if it would have stayed green, I mean, that would have been the end of it well, right there. But because the caution came out at a very opportune time, um, he only lost a couple of spots in track position. So that was a very lucky break for Rossi right there. Uh, it wasn't so much for drivers who didn't pit under the green and now had to pit under yellow, including Scott Dixon. So 
Dixon lost some track position in that one. So Pagano leads on the restart. Uh, Rossi tries to go three wide to get back to the front, but loses a spot or two. Newgarden gets by Carpenter for second. And then we finally have our first pure lead change of the day on lap 151 when Newgarden uh, finally gets by Simon Pagano. Who had led a lot of this race. Pagano, I think, decided to let him go to finally save a little bit of fuel. Hunter Daly had a great run at this point, and he made it up to fourth, uh, getting by Bourdais. And then, while um, Rossi was trying to get back towards the front, there were a couple of occasions where Oriol Servia was basically cutting um, Alexander Rossi off down the front stretch when Rossi was trying to get around him. Thing is, Servia was a lap down. He did that a couple of times, and I was basically like, what the fuck are you doing, Servia? Like, that was ridiculous. I mean, if you're a lap down and you know you're not close to getting your lap back, get the fuck out of the way. Because that was ridiculous. Um, but one, <sighs> that's three times. Ugh, god damn it. But anyways, Rossi starts moving his way through the field. Um Gets underneath the Bourdais for fifth, and then by Daly for fourth. Uh, Pagano kicks off the final round of pit stops on lap 169. Uh, we get our second pure lead change of the day on lap 172, and Ed Carpenter gets around uh, just as Newgarden. Uh, Rossi gets by Newgarden for positioning and gets by Carpenter as they're coming off the pit lane. Um, Rossi and Carpenter then start challenging Pagano for the lead. Well, what would have been the provisional lead, because there were still a couple guys that hadn't pit it yet. Uh, Rossi actually gets around Pagano for position, and then the fourth and final caution comes out on lap 178 when we have a pretty big crash in turn three. Um, it looked like Bourdais kind of cut Ray Hall off going into turn three. Um, Ray Hall, I think, tried to stay off of him, but ended up hitting the left rear of Bourdais, spinning him out. Uh, Ray Hall goes up into the wall, and then behind them, uh, Felix Rosenquist, Zach Beach, and Charlie Kimball spun and get um, and get crashed hard. Uh, Bourdais had the hardest crash because um, his car actually went up on its side when he hit the wall. So very fortunate that he wasn't significantly injured in that one. Um, so the red flag was issued for uh, to clean up this wreck, and um, Graham Ray Hall was uh, not very happy with Bourdais, um, visibly frustrated uh, when he got out of the car. But uh, they'll go into the red flag for 18 minutes to get the wreck cleaned up. And then comes the best part of this race by far. Of course, the finish. Uh, Rossi leads on the restart with 13 left to go. Pa uh, Pagano actually passes Rossi uh, down the front stretch on the outside to take over the lead. But it was on the restart, so it doesn't count as a pure lead change. But there would be four between these two in the final 10 laps. So... Rossi makes the same move on Pagano on the next lap to take the lead back for a third pure lead change on lap 189. Then Simon Pagano does the same move again um, to take the fourth pure lead change on lap 190. Uh, so Takuma Sato, who was lapped down early in this race, uh, is now up to third in his challenger. And of course, he's a former winner of the 500. Uh, Rossi begins challenging Pagano for the lead at this point once again. Uh, Pagano, of course, at this point was doing a great job defending the inside, trying to take away the inside move from Rossi, but um, Rossi would make the move around the outside down the front stretch uh, to take over the lead for a fifth pure lead change on lap 198, which is two laps to go, but then Pagano uh, would get the lead back for, and this would be the final pure lead change and the final lead change of the day. Uh, down the back stretch with two laps to go, gets a great draft on Rossi, who was basically doing the same thing, trying to protect you uh, inside. But because um, Pagano was in a Chevy and Rossi was in a Honda, Chevy had the horsepower advantage. So uh, Pagano was able to easily power by Rossi down the back stretch and going into turn three, four, six, and final pure lead change of the day on lap 199. Rossi looked like he had one last shot going into turn three, but Pagano 
uh, did a great job snaking down the back stretch. I mean, it was he was doing one of these, trying to break the draft, and uh, was able to do so. And Pagano holds Rossi at bay on the final lap to win the 103rd Indianapolis 500 and sweeps the month of May. They basically did the same thing that Will Power did last year. And, uh, you know, for someone who early this year uh, wasn't looking too good either, much like last year. Last year, he only had two podium finishes. And then this year, hadn't gone off to a good start either. All of a sudden, the month of May comes around and boom, he knocks off two wins. And is now the championship leader. <laughs> when he wasn't even a factor in the first five races of this season. But, of course, thanks to the fact that Indianapolis... Yeah, 500 is double points. Uh, he basically won the pole, led the most laps. He basically got the maximum amount of points that he could. And is now the championship leader. He is now a factor for the championship this year. And uh, wow, what a race. What a month of May for IndyCar. Because uh, let's be, I'm going to be completely honest here. Um, the first four races of this season, eh, you know, particularly when we got to Long Beach, I mean, Long Beach was absolute trash, so I was highly skeptical going into the month of May, but the Andy, G the Andy Car GP actually delivered, uh, gave us our first pair lead change of the year. Because the first four didn't give us jack shit in that department. And we had six pure lead changes today. Not, I think, not as many as I think a lot of people were expecting. But I think a lot of drivers were just holding back a little bit. And the fuel mileage deal uh, was definitely pretty interesting. A lot of cat and mouse going on. And of course, once fuel mileage was out of the equation in the final of the race, that's when they really let loose. And it's like, yeah, this is what we were expecting all along. So, I think while last year kind of definitely missed a step, um, although last year was definitely, the weather had a lot to do with that. It was the hottest Indianapolis 500 on record last year. So, I think that definitely had a lot to do with, you know, affecting the quality of the race last year. I mean, the race last year wasn't as good as previous years. But uh, I think this year was definitely a nice return to form. And, uh, Got one hell of a finish and a great battle between Pagano and Rossi at the end uh, to close out the uh, 130 Indianapolis 500. So, my final rating for the 103rd edition of the Indianapolis 500, I'm going to give it... Because, I mean, there were a couple of instances in this race that were just kind of dumb. The penalty on Elio Castroneves was, I think pretty bad call on IndyCar's part. And then the race, a little bit of the race in the first half was a little bit eh. But things really started to heat up as we started going to the second half and then of course the great finish. Um, so a little bit of everything came out of this race. So I'm going to give this year's running of the Indianapolis 500 a 9.25 out of 10. It was a great race and a nice return to form for IndyCar. The month of May was great. And I'll uh, close it out with another great Indianapolis 500. So, um, thumbs up on that one. Great job, IndyCar. Um, even though you did have a couple botches <laughs> uh, in the middle of the race, especially that Colin Cash notice. That was bad. In my opinion. But, um, well, that'll do it for the first half of this review. Um, and, of course, this is uh, at, at the time I'm recording this, this is coming before... Uh, the Coca-Cola 600. So when it comes time for the Coca-Cola 600 review, which for, from your perspective will come after a big jump cut, um, it'll be nighttime by the time I do the uh, Coke 600 review. So um, it's time for a, you know, what the hell is it called? Um, space time, fast forward. Yeah. All right, can I move back inside for the Coke 600 review? And uh, there's a lot to get to. <laughs> so, 
let's go ahead and get into it. It's the uh, 60th Coca-Cola 600 that we're going to be reviewing now. Just got done with the Indianapolis 500 review if you're, if you're watching this on video. So as usual, all four stages were 100 laps. So here we go. I <laughs> got a lot of notes here, so we're gonna I'm gonna try to get through this as quick as possible. So William Byron starts from the pole. Uh, Kyle Busch uh, gets Byron loose, loose, real loose down the back stretch and on lap one because they were trying to kind of try to bump draft each other. And Byron got really loose, and then good thing he didn't completely lose the car because that could have been a big wreck. Although we certainly had some of those in this race. Um, Harvick up to third by Kyle Busch. Um, Almirola starts challenging William Byron for the lead. Um, with Harvick in tow, the Stuart Haas cars were good at the beginning of the race, but uh, they kind of faded late. So Harvick and Bush get by Almirola for second and third. Kyle Larson brushes the wall in turn two. Um, Bush gets loose in turn three, but gets still gets by Harvick for second. Uh, and then we had our first caution on lap 23. When Eric Jones loses a right front tire and destroys the right side of his car. And that would be a running theme of the night. So yellow seems to be the theme seemed to be the theme of the day. Because you had a yellow car driven by Simon Pagano when the Indianapolis 500. And then in this race, I think we had let's see, let me look back through my notes here. The cautions were there. 13 total. <clears throat> And of course, I don't count the stage breaks. We had 13 cautions in total, which I think is the most this season. So, yeah, this race was definitely filled with a lot of caution flags. I mean, I know it's a 600 mile race, but in previous years, we didn't have this many caution flags. But, um, <clears throat> man, I need a drink. <clears throat> but yeah, this is definitely not what Eric Jones needed because um, with Christopher Bell looking to move up from the Xfinity series and considering, you know, how good of a driver he is and how a lot of people are touting him as, you know, the next big thing in the Cup series. You know, a lot of people have him as the guy who's going to replace Eric Jones in that 20 car, which makes sense since, you know, Bell is driving the Joe Gibbs 20 in the Xfinity series, so with uh, his other teammates basically <laughs> running the show basically because you have Hamlin who won the Daytona 500 and he also won at Texas so he has two wins Kyle Busch has won three times this year Truex has won three times this year including this race and there's some things that about that that I need to talk about at the end of this in terms of how the fans reacted and I won't have any kind things to say about that but, you know, Eric Jones is on the hot seat right now. And, you know, a lot of the um, issues that he's had this year really haven't had, and haven't, okay, let me try this again. <laughs> they really haven't been his fault. You know, it's basically been mechanical issues that have, you know, taken him out of contention. And this race was a lot of the same thing. You know, he had a right front tire go down. In fact, Nearly all of the uh, Joe Gibbs affiliated cars, whether it's Joe Gibbs Racing itself or um, Levine Family Racing, they all had right front tire issues with the exception of Kyle Busch. Now he had an issue in this race as well, but not of the same nature, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Yeah, all of the uh, Joe Gibbs cars, with the exception of Kyle Busch, had right front tire issues. Now we don't know if that was because of the heat or because of you know camber issues, but they also had uh, right front tire issues in the Xfinity race as well. All of the uh, Joe Gibbs cars. So I mean that's not a coincidence. I mean there I mean there had to have been something going on with like camber and stuff like that, or the way the Gibbs cars uh, were setting them, the way they were setting their cars up. So. Um, but yeah, Eric Jones, I mean, he really needs to pull something out of his ass, you know, because he's on the hot seat right now, and if he doesn't turn it around, 
because, uh, I mean, when you look at his teammates, I mean, and then you look at what he's doing, he's lagging way behind. Because, like I said, Kyle Busch has three wins. Truex now has three wins. Um, and a lot of people were pegging Truex to not even win this year because it's like, well, he's going to the 19 car and Suarez didn't really do anything with that car. I mean, it kind of says something about Suarez because, I mean, two years in that car, didn't win a single race. We're only about, you know, a third of the way through this season and Truex has already won three times. So what does that tell you? Truex is still in the prime of his career. So, and Suarez, I mean, I think he still needs another year or two to, um, you know, really start to come into his own. Um, but he's, he is with a good team. He's with the 41. And, um, Kurt Busch, for that, it is, it is a good team. He just needs some time to gel with them. But uh, it was obvious why Joe Gibbs decided to uh, drop Suarez for Truex. Because Truex, even though he's approaching 40, uh, he's in the prime of his career right now. And, it, and, this, and this year has shown it. You know, he's won three times on three different racetracks. He won at Richmond, he won at Dover, and he won, at, he won the Coca-Cola 600 last night, as, as I'm recording this right now. So... But uh, everyone comes in for service. Cobbush wants to race off pit road. Uh, tire management would become a bit of an issue because everybody, you know, was coming in for tires. A lot of them were on uh, each of these cautions here in the first stage, and it got to the point where it's like, ooh, we may want to um, conserve our tires because uh, these teams only are, are only allowed a set amount of tires to use during the weekend, um, which I think this weekend was 12 sets. So it got to the point where tire management started to become a thing, started to become a thing, which was pretty interesting. Um, so Kyle Busch leads on the restart. Truex goes three wide with Suarez and Stenhouse for position. It's not the last time you're going to see that. <laughs> There's a certain point at the end of this race that was pretty friggin' amazing. Um, Bush and Harvick in first, second, and Truex managed to get up to fifth eventually. They were one, two, three, so it was like, uh-oh, the big three is back. Uh, Stenhouse started reporting a tire rub. I think that went away, though. Um, Bush and Harvick trade the lead on that 34. Harvick took the lead in turn two, but Kyle Bush did the crossover uh, down the back stretch and took the lead back before they got back to the start finish line, so no lead change there. At least the official lead change, I should say. Um, Byron starts closing in on... Bush and Harvick, but then we get our second caution on lap 49. Uh, another right front tire goes down, this time on Matt Benedetto in turn one. And I was like, are we really going to see a lot of these right front tire issues today? And that would turn out to be the case. As it turned out, it wasn't the Toyota, just the Toyotas that were having the right front issues. There was a couple other cars that were having issues too. Uh, everyone comes in for service. Harvick wins the race off pit road this time. Uh, we had a couple penalties on pit road. Uh, Chase Elliott got caught for speeding, and Eric Amarola had an uncontrolled tire. And this time around, I mean, I've been pretty harsh on the officials about that call. But uh, in this case, it was pretty obvious. I mean, it lost complete, lost complete control. It bounced into, even though it wasn't another pit stall per se, um, it was outside of their pit box, you know, just rolling around. I mean, that to me is the definition of an uncontrolled tire. So, yeah, that was a pretty obvious call there. Uh, Harvick leads on the restart. Kyle Busch gets a great run and retakes the lead on the restart. So, so, because it was on the restart, it's not a pure lead change. But there were a lot of lead changes in this race. Um, the big three are one, two, three on lap 57. So, kind of harkening back to last year when they were dominant. Of course, I think there's a new big three this year. Um... Of course, two of them are the same, Kyle Busch and Martin Truex Jr., but uh, Brad Keselowski, I think, has slotted into Kevin Harvick's spot because Kez has won three races this year, and so has uh, Kyle Busch and Truex. But we have our first pure lead change on lap 59 when Kevin Harvick takes the lead back from Kyle Busch. Uh, Harvick, went, and he did it with a great pass down the back stretch, he had a great run off of turn two and just, you know, drafted by him. 
And then Truex basically did the same thing a couple laps later on uh, Harvick to have our second pure lead change on lap 64. But then on lap 73, we had our third caution when Truex loses the right front tire from the race lead. But um, fortunately for Truex, he didn't hit the wall all that hard, unlike um, the Benedetto and his teammate Jones. Give me one second. wind out so um yeah he was very fortunate that he didn't hit the wall all that hard and was able to uh, actually repair the car and uh, well the crew was able to repair the car and he was able to uh, get back into the race and he was coming through the field in a hurry after that so a lot of cars come down pit road harvick wins the race off pit road but seven cars stay out on his caution again trying to manage them tires because again teams are only allowed a set amount per weekend so Daniel Hemrick leads on the restart because um, he stayed out. Had a big pack of cars in the midfield, like three wide, sometimes four wide. It was pretty crazy. We had four wide. <clears throat> excuse me. We had four wide in some spots, and then we had our third pure lead change on lap 82, and Brad, when Brad Keselowski basically blows by Daniel Hemrick on the outside. Of course, he had tires. Uh, Harvick and Ham might get around Ham, uh, Daniel Hemrick for second and third. Then we have our fourth caution on lap 86 when Kyle Busch had a huge run on Stenhouse who had gotten a little bit loose. Uh, tried, it looked like he tried to stay off of him because Kyle Busch got loose too. It looked like he got on the brakes to try to stay off of Stenhouse. But uh, gets into him and spins him down the front stretch. Uh, Stenhouse is able to save him and keep going and he basically hinted at maybe some payback on Kyle Busch later in the race if he had the chance, which... I mean, Stenhouse... Fuck off. Seriously. I mean, from the looks... I mean, I'll be the first one to admit I don't like Kyle Busch. But at the same time, it didn't look like it was an intentional spin. It looked like Kyle Busch had a run, but actually hit the brakes to try to stay off of him. And, you know, spun the house out. I don't think it was intentional by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, a few cars come in for service, so Keselowski leads on the restart. And then, right after the restart, the fifth caution came out on lap 91. <coughs> four wide off of turn four uh, causes Daniel Hemrick to be hooked into the wall by Clint Boyer. So that pretty much ends his day. Um, Harvick managed to get to the lead before the caution came out. So Harvick leads on the restart. But Kez takes the lead back in turn one on the restart, which actually happened quite a bit in this race. It seemed like even though, you know, it didn't really matter what side the leader started on, whether it was the inside or the outside, since he had lane choice. But um, it just seemed like the second place car got the better run and would take the lead down the back stretch or in turn one or whatever. And they would be leading, you know, by the end of the uh, restart. So things got stacked again in mid-pack. Thankfully, no cautions this time. Um, Hamlin gets by Elliott for fourth. Hamlin actually had a good car in this race. Harvick tries to nerf Kislowski a bit in turn two uh, to get the lead back, but he really got tight coming off of turn two and lost basically three spots, dropped back to fifth. Um, Ryan Blaney nearly lost in turn one. He was dead sideways, but somehow saved it, and that was right in front of Suarez, too. So, I probably gave Suarez a bit of the brown pants. And Keselowski wins stage one. Uh, Hamlin actually managed just to get around Kyle Busch uh, for second at the end of the stage. So, we had five caution flags in stage one. And I was like, ho ho, that's going to be one of them races, huh? Yeah. Uh... Many drivers come in for service, and Chase Elliott wins the race off pit road. Six cars stay out, including Keselowski, Hamlin, Bush, and Harvick. Again, tire management. So this time around, Keselowski leads the start of stage two, but Hamlin takes the lead down the back stretch on the restart. Hmm, where have we heard that before? Um, Bush gets trapped back in the pack after not getting a good restart. 
Keselowski gets dropped kicked back to third. Truex back into the top 10 on lap 111. That's like, damn, he's already back in the top 10. So it pretty much proved that he had a fast car too, despite the damage that he had. Um, Landon Castle had a left front tire smoking. It looked like he had a tire rub. And I think he came to pit road though. Uh, Chris Buescher bounced off the wall in turn two, but kept it going and actually came back for a top 10 finish. He actually finished sixth in this race. And, you know, it's like, why doesn't this guy have a top tier ride? Because, I mean, he's been taking that 37 car on rides that, and I've said this before, but it, but it bears repeating. He is doing so much in equipment that, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, is not really, you know, the best equipment. You know, it's on a small team and he is taking that team to great heights. And he got a top 10 finish in one of NASCAR's crown jewel races. Why isn't he being offered a better ride somewhere else? You know, it just it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense to me. Because Busher has proven that he is a damn good driver. I mean, look what he's doing with this 37 car. I mean, he is constantly in the top 10. It seems like week in and week out. Now, sometimes the finishes don't reflect those good runs. But, I mean, in this case, he got a top 10 finish in NASCAR's longest race. You know? I mean, he's been doing great things, especially this year. You know, in the, behind the wheel of that 37 car. So... You know, I don't understand why he's not being offered a better ride somewhere else. Because he's clearly got the talent to do it. Um, Jimmy Johnson had a good run in this race. Up to fourth on that 124. So he was a bit of a factor. In fact, all four of the Hendrick cars finished in the top ten in this race. Um, Chase Elliott leading the way, of course. But uh, Byron, um, Alex Bowman, and Jimmy Johnson, they all finished in the top ten in this race. Uh, Elliott and Kyle Busch goes by Johnson for fourth and fifth. And then we have our sixth caution on lap 127. Busher loses a right front tire um, after that earlier contact with the wall. But uh, he prevents, but he doesn't hit the wall. So he, he was able to get to pit road and get the um, the tire off. So a little bit of damage repaired. And I uh, was able to continue on and actually got that top 10 finish I talked about. So he actually had to recover from a right, right front tire failure himself. And I don't think he, I don't think the 37 uh, team uses Toyotas. I think they have Chevrolets. So it wasn't just the Toyotas that were having right front issues. All this this one was more due to contact with the wall. But again, it was still a right front tire issue. Uh, most of the field comes in for service. Kozlowski wins the race off pit road, and Elliott is one of several drivers who decided to stay out on this caution. So he leads on the restart. Uh, Blaney goes three ride uh, with Truex and Elliott and takes the lead on the restart. So we had another three wide situation for the lead. Um, it gets crazier than that. We'll get to that when we get to it. So Keselowski gets by Truex for second and then he takes the lead back on lap 134 from Elliott for our fourth pier lead change of the day. Not the last one. This is actually uh, the first race since Talladega that got into the double digits in pure lead changes. But there were a lot of lead changes overall, and a lot of them were on the restart. <laughs> um, the 34 of Michael McDowell gets hooked by the 32, who I think is um, Corey LaJoy, and gets into Bubba Wallace, but somehow they save it. Both have to go to pit lane to get damage repaired, but that could have been a lot worse than it was. Uh, Harvick gets by Blaney for second. Uh, Bush gets by Blaney for third, and Byron goes by as well for fourth, so Blaney drops back a few spots. Uh, Hamlin gets by Bush for third, but then Bush gets by, by Hamlin several laps later. Uh, Logano kicks off green flag pit stops on lap 155, but it would turn out to be the wrong move to make because the seventh caution came out on lap 161 did, when Denny Hamlin becomes the fourth JGR affiliated car to lose the right front tire. Doesn't hit the wall, but still lost the right front tire. So the caution caught several drivers who had already pitted, including Logano and Truex also got caught, but he would end up taking the both of these guys ended up taking the wave around though to get back on the lead lap. Everyone comes in for service, and this time William Byron wins the race off pit road. So that first pit stall from winning the pole certainly helped out here. So Byron leads on the restart, but a couple laps later, um, Keselowski takes the lead back on lap 168, fifth pure lead change of the day. 
Uh, Ryan Blaney gets by Byron for second. Alex Bowman up to third. So Bowman started showing some strength here in stage two. Kurt Busch up into the top 10 on lap 176. And then we have our eighth caution of the day on lap 188 when Ryan Priest smacks the wall after he loses a right front tire. And at this point, I'm like, yep, looks like yellow is going to be the color of the day, like I said before. So many cars come off pit road. Uh, Keselowski wins the race off pit road. Bowman decides to stay out and leaves on the restart. But Byron takes the lead on the restart. Um, but then Bowman takes the lead back a lap or two later on lap 194. And that's our sixth purely change of the day. But Keselowski starts challenging um, Bowman for the lead. Well, I got by Byron first for second, and then he starts challenging uh, Bowman for the lead. And, you know, it was kind of a mirror image of what happened at Kansas a couple weeks ago um, when Bowman was trying to hold Keselowski at bay for the win that time. Uh, this time around, it was just for uh, the stage win. Um, but there was no way that Bowman was going to be able to hold Keselowski at bay because Keselowski had four fresh tires, and Bowman had uh, stayed out under this previous caution. So Kozlowski was able to get by on lap 199 for our seventh pure lead change of the day. And Kozlowski wins stage number two. So he's won stage one and stage two with Bowman in tow. Uh, and then the field stopped at, half, at the halfway point. They came down pit road and they cut the engines off. Um, a thing that uh, NASCAR decided to do this year where they uh, would honor uh, the fallen soldiers on Memorial Day weekend. Um, you know, which is fine. I mean... It was whatever. But, uh, you know, that's pretty, I guess it's a pretty neat gesture to have a moment of silence for, you know, all the fallen soldiers and stuff. But uh, things got, got got back going again. Cars uh, come in under this brake. William Byron wants to race off pit road. Uh, several other cars uh, decided to stay out for the start of stage three, including Kyle Busch, who leads on the restart. Uh, the top eight cars actually stayed out on the stage break. We had some three wide at the bottom half of the top ten. Uh, the top four within a second of each other, about ten laps into this run. Uh, Truex gets by Harvick for third. Uh, and then Elliot and Truex start fighting hard for the second spot, and they were really fighting hard for it. Uh, Harvick starts dropping through the field like a rock, so they were obviously not keeping up um, with the track changes because, you know, when it changes from day to night, the track cools off. And it cooled off quite a bit because uh, track temperature was up around 130 degrees and air temperature was at over 90 degrees. And then when the sun went down, the track temperature dropped like a rock. Uh, I think it went down to around 90 degrees, which is a 40 degree drop from where it start from where, where it was at the start of the race, which is pretty significant. Um, and evidently the 14 didn't keep up with all the changes because Harvick started dropping you know, like a stone in water, he was back to 12th on lap 135, whereas earlier in the race he was, you know, dominating and leading a lot of laps. Um, but stage three, this is where <laughs> the race started to become a bit of a dud. Stage three as a whole was a bit of a dud. Wasn't a whole lot going on. Kyle Busch had a almost three second lead on lap 238. Uh, Truex moves up to second uh, by Chase Elliott. And then we had a point in the race where, you know, a lot of fans were just, you know, starting to go salty. Uh, a ninth caution on lap 250. Uh, Bailey Curry, who I had never even freaking heard of, who was driving the 52 car for Rick Ware this week, this week uh, gets turned by Truex off turn two. Uh, it was kind of hard to tell whether or not, you know, Truex moved up and Curry moved down. It was kind of a meeting between the two cars. Um, I don't think it was intentional on Truex's part, but um, Curry gets spun, hits the inside wall head on, but gets out uninjured, which is good. But I guess people were losing their shit over it. It's like, oh my god, I can't play Truex, you know, you know, wreck someone. You know, people seem to be, you know, hitting. Truex winning more than Bush wins nowadays, and it's like, really? Really? I mean, the amount of salt flowing after this race was ridiculous. We're going to be getting to that in a minute, though. 
Um, everyone comes in for service, so Truex and Truex went to race on pit road. Uh, Harvick was actually one of the cars that were caught by the caution. He apparently had pitted um, during this run. I guess it was an unscheduled, unscheduled pit stop though, and he got caught by the caution. So Truex leads on the restart, and then Kyle Busch and Truex trade the lead um, twice in uh, two laps. Uh, Kyle Busch had to run on Truex and managed to uh, lead at the start finish line on lap 258, but Truex had to run around the outside and got the lead back for eighth and ninth purely changes of the day. And I was like, oh, we might actually get to double digits today. Barely, but we actually got there. Um, we had a five car freight train behind Truex, but then Truex started pulling away. Uh, Elliot gets by Kyle Busch for second. Uh, David Reagan and Kyle Larson were fighting hard for the ninth position. Uh, Bush gets back by Elliott for second a few laps later. So Truex with a three second lead on lap 281. They eventually went up to four seconds. Uh, Chase Elliott got by Ryan Blaney for third after Blaney had gotten by him. So those two traded third back and forth. And Martin Truex Jr. wins stage number three. So yeah, stage three was a little weak. Everyone comes in for service. And Chase Elliott wins the race off pit road this time. So he will lead the start of stage number four. And this is where things really started to get crazy. Uh, Truex uh, actually hung side by side with Elliott for the lead on the restart, but was unable to hold on. Um, and then we had our 10th caution on lap 304, and this nearly uh, took both Bush brothers out of the race. Kurt Bush got really loose off turn four, um, spun down to the inside, gets into Kyle, uh, and actually rips the left front fender off of the one car. Um, and actually rips some of the side skirting off of Kyle's car. But somehow saves the car and is lucky he didn't get plowed because he went into um, the infield and then came back across the racetrack. And I'm like, oh, but thankfully he didn't get hit because that could have been really bad. Uh, so Kyle and Kurt pit to repair the damage. Um, it pretty much ended Kurt's night, you know, a chance to get a good finish because it basically ripped the left front fender off. Um, Elliot leads on the restart. Larson loses the nose and loses a lot of spots, which um, instant, ends up with him getting into the next caution. It was a pretty vicious one. Uh, Logano nerfed Bowman out of the way for fifth in turn two. And then our 11th caution on that 317 comes out when Kyle Larson. Um, I don't know if Clint Boyer came down and Larson came up. Kind of a similar situation to what we saw earlier with Truex and Curry. But uh, Larson and Clint Boyer come together. Uh, Boyer um, gets sent to the outside wall. Um, Larson spins to the inside. He's sideways and gets plowed by Austin Dillon who gets hit by Larson and also smacks the inside wall, destroys the three car. 42 car gets destroyed. 42 car comes back up the track. Ty Dillon uh, goes to avoid him and gets into Ryan Priest and spins himself out trying to avoid the 42. Uh, Paul Menard makes contact with David Reagan, kind of rubbing together, trying to avoid the 42 car. They were able to do that though. And they avoid the wreck, although they did get a little bit of damage. So yeah, that was a pretty uh, <laughs> that was a pretty nasty little hit by uh, for Larson and for Austin Dillon, but uh, they got out of the car all right. And just when we thought that Larson's luck was starting to turn around after winning the All Star race last week, guess we should have known better, huh? So Chase Elliott leads on the restart. Ryan Newman moves up to fifth, so he was actually having a good run. But uh, Keselowski gets Brian Newman for fifth. And then Truex challenges uh, Elliott for the lead and finally gets it on lap 344 for a tenth. And final pure lead change of the day. Was not our final lead change overall, though. I'll tell you that much. Uh, Bowman kicks off green flag pit stops with 46 laps to go, mainly due to a right rear tire going flat from hand to wall. There were several other cars that came in as well. But uh, they would all get burned by the 12th caution on lap 359 when Hamlin loses yet another right front tire. Keeps it out of the wall though, much like the previous time. 
but uh, Harvick gets burned by the caution as well as Keselowski and Alex Bowman. So they would have to take the waiver. Right? Everyone comes in for service and tricks once the race off their road. Um, so Truex leads on the restart, gets a good start this time. Uh, typically, in the prior restarts, uh, the second place car would stay alongside, but uh, and then sometimes would actually get out ahead of the leader. This time around, Truex got a great start and uh, was ahead of everybody else by the time they got out of turn two. And then Logano starts making his presence known inside the top three. You had Logano and Blaney fighting for second, so once again, it's Penske versus Gibbs. <laughs> That's been basically the, um, I guess you could say the mantra of this season. It's just been, it's been either Penske or Gibbs that's won this year. The, only, the lone exception was Talladega uh, when Chase Elliott won. So Hendrick has one win. Um, Penske has four wins. But Joe Gibbs Racing has eight wins, has nine wins in total actually now. Um, but another thing that we've kind of seen this year, Truex and Logano. Hmm, where have we seen that before? It's the damn war <laughs> between Truex and Logano. And uh, we almost saw an instant replay of Martinsville at the end of this race, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, Kyle Busch and Stenhouse start fighting hard for fourth. Of course, a little bit of history there earlier in this race, remember? And then <clears throat> after Kyle Busch gets around Stenhouse for fourth, clean, by the way, Stenhouse tries to wreck Kyle in turn three and four, tries to get him with that payback. Uh, fails and drops back a few spots and it's just like, wow, way to go, jackass. It's like Kyle actually passed you clean there and let's be honest here, the incident earlier was, I think, just a racing deal. But apparently Stenhouse didn't think it that way because of course he does. <clears throat> God, I don't like Stenhouse at all. He's a fucking jackass. Um, <clears throat> Truex, Blaney, and Logano start fighting hard for the lead. I mean, they were all right there together. Blaney was fighting hard with Logano. But then my direct TV started acting up. You know, go figure. Getting down towards the end of the race, things are getting exciting. And the, direct t the direct TV starts fucking up. But thankfully, I was able to watch the finish of the race. So at this point, it's like, yeah, Penske versus Gibbs once again. Stenhouse gets by Chase Elliott for fifth position. Uh, Blaney starts dropping back and her, and her they may have had some kind of uh, issue. Maybe like a loose wheel or something like that. And then we get our 13th and final caution on lap 390 when Brad Keselowski loses the right rear tire um, after, I think, smacking the wall and spins on the pit road. Didn't really know why the caution was needed. I mean, maybe there was debris on the racetrack, but if there wasn't, then what was the point of the caution? Because, yeah, he spun on the pit road, but he got back straight again. So, I, I thought that was a very unnecessary caution. So, this, this made thing is very interesting because um, the announcers thought that Truex was in trouble because they were all thinking, well, if Truex comes down pit road, they're all going to stay out. And if Truex stays out, then they're all coming on pit road. That's not the way it happened, though. Um, only two cars, actually only one car stayed out, which was David Reagan. Ryan Newman took two tires and Truex was the first off with four tires. So it was like, okay. So David Reagan stays out and leads on the restart. And apparently, um, this is another point where um, fans were getting really salty about. Apparently, Truex um, called to his father and asked Reagan if he was going to move to the back or stay out in the lead. And apparently, they got all, and apparently Reagan's team got all butthurt about it. It's like, no, we're, we're staying out. We're going to lead the race. And it's just like, you know, I, I mean, on one hand, I could understand why. Because, you know, it's only it's going to be five laps to go when they get the green. You know, and they say, well, we're going for the win. Let's be realistic here, people. We saw what happened. What's, we've seen what happened earlier in the race with no tires versus four tires. The guys on no tires are lucky if they don't get run over. So, on the one hand, I can understand why Reagan decided to stay up, but on the other hand, he's lucky he didn't get run over and he's lucky he didn't cause a big wreck. 
because four tires meant a lot in this case. How much? Well, here's the craziest part of the race right here. And I was like, huh, this might get a little bit ugly. So David Reagan leads on the restart with five laps to go. But uh, doesn't get a good restart. And then Kyle Busch and Ryan Newman get underneath them. So it's three wide going through turns one and two. And I'm thinking, oh crap, what's Truex going to do here? Well, I'll tell you what Truex decides to do. He goes underneath all three of them. We're four wide for the lead on the back stretch. And I'm thinking, oh, oh shit, this is not going to end well. And they somehow all make it through. However, Truex was not quite in the lead yet because uh, the outside line actually got a good run as well. And Reagan was actually back in the lead for a bit in turn three, but Truex got a great run on the inside and was able to get the lead back. And then Logano was right on his back bumper. And I don't know if Logano actually got into Truex off of turn four, which wouldn't have surprised me one bit, but Truex actually got really sideways off of turn four. I'm like, oh shit. And Logano was right behind him too. And it was actually pushing Truex down the front stretch. It's like, man, the um, flashbacks we're getting here. But um, Truex would actually hold, end up pulling away from Logano. And it was like, wow, that's all she wrote. Unless another caution came out. And it seemed like they tried their damnest to bring the caution out one more time. But uh, they actually kept it clean until Denny Hamlin lost it off of turn two on the final lap. Uh, it looked like he just lost it on his own and smashed the inside wall. Kind of similar to what happened with uh, Bailey Curley earlier. But uh, at least he was able to get out of his own power. And he actually kept the car going and I think actually crossed the finish line despite the fact that the front end was completely caved in. But uh, actually ended up 17th for the wrecked race car. And Martin Trix Jr., Wins the Coca-Cola 600 for the second time in his career. Not as dominant. I mean, he led the most laps in this race. But it was nowhere near as dominant as his 2016 victory was when he led all but eight laps, which was crazy. And, um... I gotta say... <laughs> this... I, I mean, I, I had some hopes for this package to make this 600-mile race a good race considering what, we, what we've seen earlier at the other mile and a half races. It delivered. I mean, despite all the caution flags, when we had 13 freaking caution flags, and even for a 600-mile race, that's kind of ridiculous. Although, it wasn't really, you know, much to do with the drivers. It was more of the setup of the car and right foot tires, you know, going down. But... Despite the high amount of caution flags, the amount of competition in this race and the craziness, I mean, it was just like, wow. You know, this is probably the most invested I had been in a 600 in years. Because let's be completely honest here. I mean, the last, the last 10 years of the 600, I can probably only think of one that was actually decent. I mean, a lot of times this race is fucking trash, but it actually ended up being a pretty damn good race. Um, Eric Estep rated it at 85% on his Ruby gauge. That's about how I feel about this race. So, yeah, I would say this was the best 600 uh, in a while, despite all of the caution flags, because the racing was actually pretty damn good. We had 10 pure lead changes in this race which is the most at a non-restricted plate race since I started keeping track of that stat. 10 pure lead changes in this race. That's pretty damn good. And it had a lot of, I think it had over 30 actual lead changes in total because it seemed like, you know, there were <laughs> lead changes on every single friggin' restart. And of course the last restart was no exception. And we also had that full wide at the end. That was like, holy crap, dude. That was crazy. So overall, I mean, when you look at the Indianapolis 500, how good it was. And then the Coke 600 here, despite all the caution flags, it was pretty damn good. So, I mean, 
Memorial, Memorial Day weekend. It's 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 motor racing's greatest day because you have the Monaco Grand Prix in Formula One, which is its crown jewel. Um, the Indianapolis 500, which is a new car's crown jewel, and the Coke 600, which is one of NASCAR's crown jewels. I mean, it, they all come together in one day, and um, it's considered motorsports' greatest day, and for obvious reasons. And for once, the 600 finally lived up to its billing and pulled its own weight. So, uh, my final rating for the Coca-Cola 600, I'm going to give it an eight and a half out of 10. Yes. Um, it's the highest rating I think I've ever given the 600 by far. I think the highest before that was a five and a half, but that tells you anything. Mm. But, you know, after the race, you know, Twitter basically turned into a massive sea of salt because there were a lot of people that were not happy about Truex winning after some of the stuff that happened in this race. Of course, you know, the Curry thing happened, and then, of course, you know, asking Reagan what he was doing on that final restart, which, I'll be honest, Reagan was lucky he didn't get run over. And, listen, you know, I can understand... You know, if you don't like a certain driver and you're not exactly happy if, you know, a driver wins that you don't like. But some of the salt that was coming out of some of these fans was fucking atrocious. Like, there's one guy, I think he's called The Rooster, who basically called Truex an F-A-G-D-O-T. And it's just like, wow, you are that fucking butthurt over, you know, a driver winning a race. And I was just like, real mature, dude. And then he came back and I was like, I didn't ask for your opinion on my mental state, dude. Well, guess what? I don't give a flying fuck if, I, if you ask for my opinion or not, bitch. You're acting like a fucking tarred monkey. I mean, you're getting so fucking salty over a driver winning a race. And trust me, I, I, there are times when I've been not very happy with certain drivers, but these guys are taking it way over the cliff. And it's like, you know, how about you go out and pu- I dare you to go out in public and say the F, you know, that F word, you know, where everybody can hear you and not when you're hiding behind a fucking keyboard. I guarantee you, you would get your ass stumped. You fucking punk. That's why I don't like associating myself with this fan base. It has some of the most toxic motherfuckers on the face of the planet. You know, and they wonder why other sports fans and other people look down on them with contempt. It's because they're a fuck- bunch of fucking toxic ass ass. Who seem to have a cock up their ass all the time. And it, ju- it just makes the whole sport as a whole look like fucking trash. And they don't seem to realize it. And I don't really think they fucking care either. And it's pretty clear that this guy has no maturity whatsoever considering, you know, his response to me. And I was like, fine, fuck you then. You're not, you're, you're nothing more than a piece of shit in my opinion. I mean, if you have to resort to, you know, egregious insults like that, then fuck yourself. You're not worth anybody's time. And your opinion, as far as my, as far as I'm concerned, your opinion is fucking worth. bullshit and I can understand you know not liking certain drivers but there's a fine line that you have to stay behind and he went over he went way over it by a country mile it's ridiculous and there's no place in the sport for it well I pretty much said my piece on that and uh, this portion of the review is taking 45 freaking minutes. Wow. Combine that with the 500 review, and damn, that's over an hour. <laughs> so, easily the longest video that I've ever done here on what is now known as the Fuel. Bit of a name change, like I said at the beginning. But um, I kind of knew that this uh, review was probably going to go long because there was a lot of stuff to talk about. You know, from. You know, both the race reviews probably going to go long to, you know, all the stories that happened 
in the last few weeks. I mean, it was, it was, this was crazy. <coughs> but, um, next week, NASCAR goes to Pocono, and IndyCar has their Detroit doubleheader. So, that'll be yet another <laughs> busy time again, um, next weekend. So, I know this video is going to be coming out on a Monday, but, you know, since the Coke 600 ended so late, I mean, it ended up past 11 o'clock and the race started at 6 I think around 6 30 so it's about a five hour ordeal <laughs> so I was pretty much zonked out by the time the <laughs> race finally ended so um, that's going to do it for this very long episode of the fuel uh, thank you very much for watching and until next time this is the Packer Man signing out have a good one.